Um, you're here for the If Not You Who, and we're talking about um, empowering instructors to meet ADA standards. And before we get into the actual presentation, you guys have a game to play while we're doing this. So this is If Not You Who Bingo. So as we're talking, when you see or hear any of the things on your bingo sheet, cross it off. And then if while we're in the middle of this, you get your bingo, yell bingo. Um, and then we have three lovely prizes. So wonderful um, LCSC swag. So with the, and there's stuff in there. Um, and then also on the back of the bingo sheet is a survey. Um, we like to ask questions. So we would like some information about what you guys are doing. And you can fill it out now or at the end um, after you've heard us talk for a second too. So that's, that's the fun part while we're getting into this. So what we are going to be talking about today is we'll introduce who we are, both as a college and as our department and ourselves. Um, where did we start with ADA on our campus? Um, as well as what resources we're putting out there um, for our faculty to become get all their classes ADA compliant. We'll talk about how that's going, where we're at in the process, and we'll also talk about where we're gonna go next. So I'm gonna turn it over to Angela, and she's gonna introduce us and tell you a little bit about LCSC all as right. well. All right, so we always like to make <clears throat> the joke, and sorry for my voice, I'm getting a little cold. We always like to make the joke when we go to conferences, we're Lewis hyphen Clark, and we're in Lewis, in Idaho, because there is Lewis and Clark, and they are in Oregon. So we're the ones with the hyphen. We are Lewis Clark State College. And I'm not gonna read this whole slide, you can read, but we're a four-year college. We have over 90 degrees. Um, as of fall 2017, we had a full-time headcount of 3,924 students. So we're not huge, but we're not too small. And that's just a little bit of some stats about who we serve and who our students are. So a lot of talk has been about first generation college students and we actually have 68% of our students being first generation college students. So we have a strong non-traditional student population. So this is e-learning services. So Carrie, Dawn, and myself are all from e-learning services. So Dawn's gonna introduce herself and give you a little bit about her background. Good afternoon, uh, my name, oh, look at him go. Oh, that was quick. <laughs> Quick. That was super quick. Did you fill out your survey yet? Yeah, hang on, hang on to your card. Hang on your card. Okay. Nice. That was really bad. That was really good. Good job, man. Good job. All right, well, my name is Don Lesprince. I'm the director of e-learning uh, at Lewis Clark State College, and I oversee the testing center as well. So I wear a couple different hats. Um, my background, I actually came from Kansas State University. Um, I was going to run an honor system when I grew up. And so, and that didn't pan out. <laughs> I did a little advising, I did some proctoring, and here I am. So, big exciting trip from Kansas to Idaho. Um, underneath me is my administrative assistant. Um, she, we call her the boss of the office because she does everything. Uh, Tom Hennigan is our uh, instructional technology administrator. Uh, he does all the really technical, hairy stuff in Blackboard, um, works with our SIS colleague, uh, and does all of that. And then Bruce New kind of works under Tom, uh, running uh, different programs, running reports, uh, doing archiving, that kind of thing. Okay. So I'm Angela Beek. I'm the senior instructional designer in e-learning. So there's lots of jokes about how I need a bunch of cats and an Afghan in my blanket because I'm the senior. Um, <laughs> I've been at LC for 10 years, and my background is in education. I have my master's in educational technology from Boise State. I did their program entirely online. Yep, some Boise State people, yeah. <laughs> Um, and I also have an elementary ed degree, so that's my background. And then I am Carrie Kaiser, and I came to LCSE about two years ago. I am what I call an accidental instructional designer. Um, my background is actually in landscape architecture and environmental sciences, um, but kind of fell into the realm of education, and my interest in technology kind of led me to this field. So I approach a lot of instructional design a little bit more from the design side than the pedagogy, pedagogy side. So, um, and I think that's, that's about our whole that's our office, our e-learning services office. So as you listen to the rest of this as our process, um, you can take that into consideration that that's the people that are working on it. And these are all the people that we serve. So we have seven academic divisions on campus and we have a technical and industrial side. We have workforce training and professional technical academy. They do a lot of um, non-credit bearing courses and some things with the high school students taking college classes for credit. 
We have about 180 instructors who use Blackboard for online and hybrid classes. And about every semester we have about 450 online sections. Now that's not unique classes. There might be multiple sections of English 101, that kind of thing. But that's kind of our workload for the five of us in our department. All right, so Don's gonna come up and talk a little bit about our kind of our background and how we got involved in the ADA side of things. Thank you. So I've been at LC about 15 months now. And I came in, like I said, for more of an academic integrity perspective of things. Um, but along with that is I was very involved with doing ADA on other campuses that I had been on. And so going through the classes, I was getting familiar with our college. And I say college now and not university. Um, that took some time. But so at our college, uh, we were looking through the classes, figuring out what we had, what we didn't have some areas that we might be able to grow and work with different departments on their classes. And in that found that really none of our classes were ADA compliant. We had a couple that were hit or miss, but really I would say 98% of our classes showed no sign of any kind of compliance effort. So I got to make everybody really mad really early. <laughs> Great to be new on campus and then make everybody mad saying you have to do this. Um, but we had seen some small steps over the course of the past couple years before I got there, um, but most of them had been physical. Um, curb cuts, um, making stairs you know, more accessible, putting in ramps, that kind of thing. Nothing had really been done inside the classroom. Um, kind of the reason we got involved is since we oversee the online classes, it made sense, but our instructional designers have great relationships with the divisions that they work with. Um, how we do it is we essentially take all the divisions, split them in half, Carrie gets half, Angela gets half. So um, when, say, somebody in humanities has a question, they know they can call Carrie, because Carrie is their person, and uh, she'll help them fix what they need to do. Um, and that also helps them to feel like they can share things with that person instead of just coming into the office and talking to whoever. So on campus, like I said, there had been a little bit of effort on campus, but not classroom-wise. Um, but we do have a campus accessibility statement. Uh, this was originally penned in 2014, um, and it's undergone some, some changes, but um, just essentially saying we know what the federal regulations are and we should do something about it. But there was never really a plan in place to do that. Uh, there is a disability access committee. Um, I actually sit on that committee, and there's, I think there's eight of us on that committee now. Um, from different divisions around campus, different departments, where we talk about what needs to be done. Again, most of that is physical things, um, but we are starting to shift some of our thinking there. And then there was a big push about two years ago for web accessibility, just making sure that our websites were screen reader adaptable, that the colors were uh, appropriate, that kind of thing. So from that, knowing we had this need to fill, uh, we developed a plan. And knowing that it was going to take some time to do, we planned it out over a two-year span. And uh, early in the day, I heard somebody say that they chopped things up to, yeah. yeah. And you, you do have a copy of this as well. Um, that it makes it so it's, you can, oh, I think it was actually Anna that said it. Uh, you break it down into pieces that are easier to, to complete. And so we started easy. Uh, we use Blackboard currently. And the first thing that we did was locked it down as far as color scheme. Um, I'm sure lots of you who have uh, LMSs that you can personalize a little bit, um, yellow letters with pink backgrounds, um, bright green writing on black, uh, stuff that you look at and your eyes melt out of your head. Uh, and it's not good for the student, it's definitely not ADA compliant. So the first thing we did was locked it down so we have a white background, dark blue lettering. It also happens to fit our branding which is big on everybody's minds right now. Uh, and we actually did that this last summer. Then the first thing we're really focusing on is syllabus, um, going through and working with instructors to make sure their syllabi um, have headings, you know, secondary headings, the font's correct, that kind of thing. Again, color is a big thing. Um, and then you can read along and see kind of where we went, but you'll notice that closed captioning actually runs the full span. Um, obviously it takes the longest, it takes the most time. Uh, and we wanted people to be able to work on it as they went. Um, and, you know, as it says, it really did chop it up. Um, but the biggest part of this was that um, we didn't want to be the ADA police. 
<laughs> We're not at all interested in that. That's not why we pay our instructional designers. Um, and so the process does defer to someone outside of us and be that a compliance officer if if we're lucky enough to get one, uh, back to the divisions, to the chairs, um, it does defer that ownership back to the people who teach those classes. So knowing why we needed to do it, having a timeline now that, hey, this is when we want to do it, um, there's always the how. So you, know, you can tell the instructor, you need to have your classes ADA compliant, and they're like, okay, but how do I do that? So based on the timeline, uh, we worked with the instructor designers, a couple of people on campus, and decided that if we could have one place where all of this information could live, that would, that would be the best. But how would we build it so that it would be usable for everybody? And Carrie, actually, um, our designer person, um, universe, Universal Design for Learning, I know we have some fans in the room of that, uh, <laughs> and worked out perfectly for our, us uh, to build this space. And so Carrie is going to tell you about that. Go ahead. Can you go back to slide? Yeah. What is that guy holding? A magnifying glass. Oh, I knew it. So it's funny. I was thinking when that was up there. I was I was honestly thinking. I was like, what we should make sure that they see all these. There is. Do you have one too? Do you have one too? Oh, we got it. There's our third one. You guys can most definitely keep playing bingo. You can definitely keep playing bingo, but I will say the prizes are gone. We didn't. Sorry. Sorry about that. I can give you five Met Bucks. There you go. You got a five Met Bucks for the next. Five Met Bucks if you get a well, gosh, I should have been playing if I would have known Ryan was giving out Met Bucks for it. <laughs> gosh dang it. All right. Okay. Yes, magnifying glass. All right. So what I'm going to talk about real quick is like what resources we gave um, to the faculty to meet this timeline. So don't let you know what we were trying to do. Um, the thing that I'm going to cover here is our asynchronous training, our Universal Design for Learning org, which is in Blackboard. But we also did meetings with divisions and professional development trainings, and Angela will talk about those after we look at the training session. So what we decided to start with was we talked about why we were going to put this in Blackboard. I mean, we have a couple ways we could get this information out to them, but our LCSE faculty all have access to it, whether they teach fully online or not. Um, they are already trained to get training in there. They're used to getting um, information from us, the instructional designers in there. When they create a new online course, that's where they go. So they're already used to using it for training. And as well, we also kind of wanted to show them by doing. We built this class in there. It is ADA accessible. You can do it too. So that's why we went with using Blackboard. And then why we went with calling it for universal design rather than just this is your ADA compliance training, go do it, is we do want to promote that idea of learning for all, for learning for people across the board. And then we always try to use that, the um, analogy of the curb cut effect. So curb cuts were put into effect and coming from my construction and design background, I did a lot with curb cuts. And they're there for someone in a wheelchair. They started showing up after World War II when that population became more and more. And so places started putting those in. But those curb cuts don't help just someone in a wheelchair. They help someone with a stroller. They help a little kid learning to use a bike. They help our very own Dirk the Dinosaur from our office. He's one of our little mascots, ride his skateboard. So he can go down the curb cut. And if you notice, even people who are able-bodied will almost always funnel towards that curb cut and use it because it's there and it's accessible to all. So that's the, the idea behind why we went with the universal design and how we're moving forward with that. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna real quick take a look at our training class. So let me pull it up here. So this is what faculty will see when they come in to the class for training. So you know we talked about um, having the timeline, which we have it in here for them as well, um, and as well as the legal requirements of to why. I mean, it is the law and it's the right thing to do, but you know we do have to put that in there. But once you come under our course content, you'll see that even amongst the steps that are in the timeline, we've broken it into four steps that they can go through to meet the timeline. And it's, there's actually five steps. The fifth one is the review process. So we start, again, Don mentioned starting with the syllabus, because it's one thing that's pretty much universal to every college class. Everybody has one. Everybody has it ready. And we wanted them to be able to go in and make their syllabus ADA compliant. So that can be anything from 
you know, using style guides and words so that the screen reader can use it. That's anything from colors to having their alt text. So the things that they learn in creating the accessible syllabus then fall over into the other things in the timeline. So by learning this one thing, they're empowered to be able to do the rest of the things in the timeline. And within our steps, I won't go through um, everything specifically in here, but um, a lot of it will give an overview, and then we have a tutorial that walks them through anything they may have in their syllabus and how to do it, as well as using like the accessibility checker in Word. Um, if you are on a Mac, Word doesn't have the accessibility checker in there, but it does have all the styles features to make it. Go ahead. This is not open to the public. Our training class is not. So um, we can give you, if you have more questions about this information, we can definitely um, share that as well, though. And then uh, it's very similar for all of them. So creating the syllabus, again, it's one of the biggest ones just because they learn the other things in it. The biggest, most complicated task that I'm sure every campus is struggling with is getting closed captioning. So there is actually, within closed captioning, there's steps on how to record your lecture, how to share it. We, we encourage and basically expect all our faculty to save their videos out to YouTube, caption there, and then embed their files into Blackboard. We don't have the storage um, within e-learning to house all the videos directly in Blackboard. So they're housed out in YouTube and then um, embedded. Yes? So are you having your... Faculty are doing the captioning. They're doing the captioning. Caption it. it. Yes. We'll talk about this is that. The popularity thing I was about. Yes. <laughs> and we'll talk about that a little bit more. Don will say where we're at with that okay. as we get going. Um, we have had that exact reaction. I won't lie. Um, but the thing that we're encouraging, especially with new made videos, is if you start recording your video with a script, captioning takes less than a minute in YouTube. You copy and paste your script and it times it for you. So, yes, that may sound daunting, but if you're following a good step and sequence in making a good micro lecture to upload? There's the key word there. There's micro, micro lecture. Yeah. Yes. That's, that's next year. Yeah, that's next year. We'll do that. We're just talking about this. We gotta get, yeah, we gotta get them. Yes, yes, it does. It does, and we'll definitely be, be covering a little bit of that too. But there's steps in here for them. So a faculty, if it's two in the morning and they're trying to do their lecture and they need help, and obviously I'm not in the office to help them, they have the tutorials and everything here. And it's the same with the other steps as well. I'll just quick go through them. Um, this is making accessible files and documents. Again, that'll go through using PowerPoint, Excel. Um, it's typical documents that we use. And then talking about the um, color and formatting issues as well. And then into the review process, which that's something we are still working on as well. As Don mentioned, we don't want to be the ADA police in our office. We're, I'm there to help faculty, and I don't want to be the one that's being the cop and telling them that. So um, we are looking possibly, I think Don mentioned doing a compliance officer, but that's kind of possibly in the future. So that's the, the training that our faculty get um, for the most part. And then Angela is gonna talk more about um, the other things we've tried to do for training to get them, to get our faculty to where they need to be. All right. Yes, no, are yep. we up there? Okay, there we go. There you go, okay. All right, so <clears throat> of course we, we get assigned this project and we're like, okay, right, cool, we, we need to do this. You know, we're seven years behind the ball, right? Because these laws came out in 2010. So we had to figure out how we were gonna reach out to our faculty. Wow, <clears throat> sound, I sound awful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So what we did was <clears throat> we met with all of our academic divisions to share the two-year plan. So we asked if we could come to their division meeting because that's where they've got all of their faculty hostage for an hour and a half at the start of each semester. And so we came and we talked about the plan. And those of us that gave us more than 15 minutes, we actually did a 15-minute demo on this is how simple it is to make your syllabus accessible. We walked them through really quick. And obviously we acknowledged that this is just a quick shot, but just to show you, it really can be done in 15 minutes. So we met with them, uh, showed them how to make this syllabus accessible. We talked a little bit about the captioning process and the options for doing that. And then we had Q&A sessions. So they were able to ask us what questions they had, what were their concerns, what, you know, 
obviously we couldn't get into the nitty gritty of how do we do this at their division meetings, but it was just a chance for them to kind of start wrapping their brains around what we were asking them to do. And we also decided that obviously if we're expecting them to do this, then we need to model and have all of our documents and all of our videos compliant. So whenever we do a new training or we have a new tip sheet or whatever, we always make sure it's captioned, the videos are captioned, the sheets are accessible for a screen reader. So we're modeling what we expect them to do. So of course, there were a wide range of faculty reactions as you might imagine. I mean, we had people who were outright angry, like I am not doing this. I'm a tenured faculty member. I will just not teach online anymore if I have to do this. And there were those who were stepped up and they were advocates, they were like, you know, this is great, you know, I mean, people with disabilities already have a hard enough time as it is, like we should want to help them. And it isn't just about people with disabilities, it's all range of learners, you know. So we had a wide gamut of reactions, you know. These are just a few, but thankfully, it seemed like the how was the bigger concern than the why. So there weren't that many people that were like, well, why do I have to do this, I'm just not going to. It was more like, well, this is a big task, what do I do? So, Again, kind of recapping what their concerns were. What do we have to do? You know, when do I have to have this done? How do I do it? You know, well, what are you going to do to me if I just don't do it? You know, and is, who's going to help me? And then kind of the biggest question that came up was, why can't someone else do it for me? And, and that's kind of how we came up with the title of our presentation. You know, if, if you don't do it, well, who is? We don't have the staff and the money, really, to pay someone else to do it. Or do we? We don't know. But Really, what it comes down to is that's your content, that's your course, and as an educator of students, you should want to be doing this. Um, and it's also, it's a good life skill. Once you learn how to do it, everything you do moving forward will be accessible to anyone that needs it. So this is how we responded to those concerns. Of course, the timeline is what answers the what and the when. We have workshops to answer the how, and we, we did it, I think I did three and you did two. Carrie did captioning workshops and I did accessible syllabus workshops and it was actually kind of disappointing that we had really low or no attendance. I think I had maybe the most three faculty show up. So they're all very concerned about how to do it but then they didn't attend the trainings and that's another reason why we needed to have that online resource. Um, but that was kind of like, well, we have this available to you and then you don't come. So we built the org and that answers all of the hows for them. And then, of course, we're there for the how and the help face to face. I mean, we, we've made it very clear in numerous occasions that we are here to help you. Like, if, if you need to sit down with us one on one to do your syllabus, we are happy to do that. We have appointment calendars come in and we will help you with all this whole process. And again, if you don't do it, who's going to do it? You know, it would, it would take hundreds of hours for someone else to caption your stuff or for e learning to caption your stuff or it's about a dollar a minute to pay a service. Well, that's, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars right there. Um, there's also hundreds of hours involved if we were to go out and be the police and download all your syllabi and make them accessible. And, and really what it comes down to is you really are the best source. You know what documents are in your course. You know what students are accessing. And so you've got to have that accountability piece. Um, the other thing that we try to explain is if we're doing all this accessibility stuff for instructors, then that's where all of our time goes. Then we don't have time to help them with the day-to-day -day stuff that they're calling us or stopping in and asking for help for. So, you know, we can't, we just, we don't have the staff hours to be the compliance officers. So, Don's gonna talk a little bit about where we're going next with all this. All right, so as we've kind of alluded to, where we are, you know, off what I often hear from administration is, so how's that ADA thing going? And, and I hear this from multiple layers of administration, um, faculty, staff, you know, that kind of thing as well. But the truth is we're kind of all over the board at this point. Um, obviously, there's always those early adapters that we love and wish we could pay more money and buy them cars. Um, <laughs> And they're the ones that we said, hey, we need to do ADA. You know, we know it's big, we know it's daunting, but it has to get done. And they're like, what do I need to do? Give me a resource, I'll do it. And so we had some instructors who, I would say probably in the first six months, were done for all their classes across the board. They just sat down, knocked it out. Um, 
And then we have you know, the hesitant participants where they want to do the right thing, and so they're starting small. They're doing some of their documents. Uh, they're working on some of their PowerPoints. Um, but they're probably not working on captioning. Um, generally, those are the people who are like, well, I'll do it if I finish everything else. But I'm going to wait, because you may find somebody or some money, and you can pay, and then I don't have to do it. Um, then we have our holdouts, which are the ones that are our tenu some of our tenures who are like, I'm not going to teach online. I'm going to pull all the videos from my classes so I don't have to caption them. Um, really staunch no people. Um, and what we found is that of those holdouts, they're in two camps. So the first is pay me more money um, or block off time and pay me money to do it. Or the other camp, and luckily this has been a very, very small group of people, um, but I don't have people with disabilities in my classes. Um, and this is actually a twofold part because we have a very, I'm going to say robust, we have a very robust nursing division. Um, and, you know, the terminology in nursing can be challenging, we'll say that. And so they have within nursing positions that someone with a disability physically couldn't do. And unfortunately, that's just the truth of it. So there are some classes that probably with somebody with a disability isn't going to take, but they know that they still need to do it. They know it's the right thing. So while we do have these people in the holdout section, we do have some of these people up here too. So, so this is more the me question um, when we get bogged down in these meetings and the planning and we start talking about the money, um, oftentimes I'm like, are we there yet? Um, and so, you know, administration has been fantastic. Um, you know, I, we came out of the gate, we're like, really want to do this. Uh, we worked with our disability services office and the provost and then the deans um, were all right behind us. Um, just this past week, actually, we got the official sign off from the, our provost and our uh, deans that we have right now saying that they're behind it um, and they approve of the plan. Uh, later this month, we'll go to Faculty Senate and ask for their endorsement uh, so that they know for sure, here it is, we're going with it. Um, that way we're not having a big rollout going, hey, look at our college, we're not ADA compliant. Um, but everybody at least then knows that we've started. Um, and so the best thing about our provost is that um, she really is committed to assisting faculty. Uh, she was a nursing faculty. She was the chair in nursing. So she's been in their shoes, and so she's very much an advocate for the faculty. Um, she's looking at maybe offering some incentives for people who want to do their captioning early. So if you do your captioning early, you might get some kind of you know, financial reward. Uh, there might be some student workers who can help you with it. Um, and all that stuff will hopefully fall into place here in the next couple months. Uh, but certainly that would help with those hesitant people in the middle, I think. So per the timeline, um, in theory, by fall 19, all of the courses that have a Blackboard presence will be ADA compliant um, and will. I like this. I write this big everywhere. It will be. <laughs> like I'm Darth Vader and it's my will. Um, but again, we're not the ADA police and we don't want to be. So we're holding out hope of, above hope that at some point we'll have some kind of compliance officer uh, that can work with the chairs and the divisions um, to do this. So we talked a little bit about the review process. So spring of 19 is kind of when that process starts. Um, as I said earlier, it's done by peers or divisions, but uh, e-learning actually built the rubric to use. Um, and it's in our org space. And that root, it essentially has two versions. There's a short version so that once they get it down and what they're looking for, they can just run through and click the boxes. Um, and the other one is a little more detailed. So when you're looking for captioning, is it time synced? Are the words correct? Um, that kind of thing. But we, by building that rubric, we think we're giving whoever's going to be doing this a good tool so they can check boxes so that it will go quickly down the road. So Carrie is going to hand out one more document here. Um, this document we creatively acquired from um, another organization. And I believe this is Portland Distance Ed, Portland Community College. Um, and they had a very similar document. And it's one that when we found it, we did kind of a little happy dance. Because this was exactly what we've been trying to relate to people, but hadn't put to paper. 
And so essentially it comes down to compliances about responsibility. Um, if it's, you know, if it, the instructor, as Carrie said, you, or I believe as Angela said, it's your class, it's your material, you know what's there. So you would really be the best source here. And so we kind of went through what the instructor's uh, responsibilities would be in that. When we talked about any learning services, you know, obviously we started this ball rolling. We're very accountable in the process. And so we put in there how that we could help with the system. Um, to get that. And then disability services. Um, our disability services office on campus, uh, they handle student accommodations, they do some uh, student testing, they do counseling services, so they do wear a lot of hats as well. And so uh, they've been doing, they've been working with those small steps in the background here as well, but this definitely gives a definition to what is their role in this as well. And so it's just getting all of the people on the same page, which is kind of nice. So, does anyone have any questions for us before we start grilling you guys? You didn't know there was going to be a test, huh? It's a quiz. Well, not really. An assessment, an I assessment. guess, would be, be the more the, the higher ed word we want to use. How accurate are you finding the YouTube? So we don't necessarily recommend using the auto captioning in YouTube. Um, I use the example of, I gave a presentation on um, Snagit, the program that can capture, it's made by TechSmith, and we, I used it as a sample for auto-captioning, and every time I said Snagit, it said peanut sauce in the auto-captioning. And I know, like, I speak fairly, I speak fairly, did you, the, Ryan has five dollars for you. Oh yeah, he got it. Uh, so, um, that's my, that's kind of our running joke. It's like, yes, the auto captioning in YouTube and other programs that we've looked at. I should say we do refer to YouTube and Snagit and everything, but that's because we have looked at other programs and things for auto captioning and it has not worked well. The other thing with the auto captioning is it is not um, punctuated and um, capitalized. And so that does not meet, meet ADA compliance. So even if you are using the auto captioning and it is picking up your words exactly right, you still need to go in and edit it. So we, again, are recommending to our faculty that before you record these, make yourself a script. First, it keeps you on track, and then your captioning, if you have a script, your captioning literally takes a minute. You copy and paste. It's not, not that bad. We do realize, though, of course, that our faculty do have videos that they may have made six years ago, that they're still, the content is still accurate and still available. And so for those, they are having to do a transcript, you know, and then put it in. Um, they can also, we do show when we do a captioning um, information, we do show them how to use the um, type while YouTube will pause and you can keep typing while it's doing it. So we do show them that as well. But as far as auto captioning, no, it's not accurate. Yeah. And we have some instructors who just insist, I will not type the script <clears throat> when I lecture. It's off. Wow, I'm really croaking. You are. <clears throat> it's, they just go off the cuff and then they've acknowledged that <laughs> they can figure out what I can talk for. Yeah. <laughs> and, but those um, faculty have acknowledged that they are going to have to put in the extra time and go back in. But our, we have a few faculty who are very much like, I cannot write a script. Like, yeah. just cannot. Um, and what they have, we just let them know, you know, okay, you can do that, but you are going to have to spend a little extra time then when you need to do your captioning. So. Moving forward, we're going to try to put out some workshops about what we called earlier micro lectures. This idea that when you're recording for an online class, it shouldn't be an hour long. We actually have an instructor who records three hour long lectures, yeah. uninterrupted. He does not even break them into parts and post yeah. them as parts. It's three hours and it's, yeah. it covers two weeks of content and his response when he said, you really need to chunk these. Well, they can pause and resume. Yeah. No one's going to sit and watch a lecture for three hours or even for an hour. And, and when you're giving a live lecture for an hour, you're not lecturing for an hour straight. You know, there's Q&A, there's a break, there's an opportunity to ask questions and switch subjects. And so we're, we want to put something out there that helps the faculty kind of rethink a yeah. lecture material in an online class. I mean, 15 minutes is really the, the max that you should be doing for an online lecture. And some of that has to do with where the students are coming from. They're connecting from places where streaming is difficult, their internet connection is not that great. And so if they're having to try to stream something, there's this gigantic file, they're gonna have problems with that. And that is something we do have to take into consideration at LCSC. We do have a lot of students who are, are, are who are in rural Idaho. So downloading a video 
is just not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. So streaming something short off of YouTube, you have a better chance of being able to have it, have it there for you. So and part of that micro lecture piece is that write a script and I just I guess I don't buy the I I can't write a script because you can type a script in a conversational tone. You can type the script however you yeah, want. Yeah, you don't so, have, it doesn't have to be formal. Yeah, you know, you're not going to sound like a robot if, even though you're typing it out and so we're still trying to convince those people like no, trust me, like you could still do a script and and if you if you drift a little bit from the script, then you can fix that in the captioning. That's still going to be yeah. less time than going back and captioning your own stuff because yeah. we've We've done our own captioning of things that we've presented and we've estimated it's about three times as long. So if you're captioning an hour, it's gonna take you about three hours. And, yeah. and we found that to be a pretty consistent. Uh, yes. So Go ahead. So she, my question is that, okay, I'm not, I'm fine on the channel, but just leave me alone. Mm -hmm. Um, we, personally, at e-learning services, would not do anything. That would be something that the chair would have to address. Um, all of the chairs of our seven academic divisions are aware of our timeline and what we're trying to do, and they're all behind the fact that they want all their classes to be ADA compliant. As far as what they're going to do to those faculty that have said that, I'm unsure. So um, that's not, not our judgment. The only part that we would supply is if if that chair wanted us to work again with that faculty or anything, that's where we would su provide support. But as far as being the ones that are like, no. Um, Can you have you considered or recommended um, administrators to issue the faculty like online training to educate before they are allowed to? Yes, that has been, well, it's been talked about yeah. at previous points, but so far we aren't there yet. Um, our faculty are kind of very much like, we've already got so much on our plate, completing another series of training is not possible. And to be honest, I have to agree with them. They're stretched pretty thin. So yes, things like that have come up. Um, the one thing we do have possibly coming up for us is we may be changing LMSs in a year to two years. So changing from Blackboard to whatever. And at that point, we're hoping to have a push again to get ADA compliant. Um, and so with that opportunity, there would be required training. And so therefore, at that moment, we could kind of tie in that online, like you're required to get this certificate before. Yeah. yeah. Um, kind of along those lines. So I guess I'm back backtracking. So coming, when I came in as director, we were already as a state looking at a change of LMS. Um, and so initially we had this big push to get the classes as compliant as we could before we switched to a new LMS. Um, and that state bid kind of imploded on itself last year. When that happened, there was kind of a step back because then everybody was like, well, then we don't have to do it, right? Because we're not switching. Um, and so with the potential LMS shift, that would be something that, that we would like to see and something our provost has expressed that she would like to see as well, that any classes that roll over into the new LMS, if we do switch, have to be compliant going into that system. And so they would have to be compliant within Blackboard before they were transferred over um, to, whatever. to whatever we switch to, or if we switch to something. And so that's also where that two-year timeline kind of came in. Yeah. 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 Any other questions? So have you had good participation in this optional class? Yes and no. When we have had divisions, so we have, what is it, 250 users in there? 100? Something, like something like that. And we've had about 50 active users. So that definitely we want more, of course. Um, but what we have seen more of um, is individual faculty who have learned about it, scheduling appointments with us, and working with us more individually. Um, and we also have been pushing this within our, um, we use Quality Matters rubric. Um, to build new classes in each summer, we do a core cohort where about like 12 to 15 faculty build new classes. And th those group of faculty have been active in our training class. But um, we haven't done a huge, huge push out um, advertising of it as much. They're all in there, so if they saw it, they could go to it, but we're still in that advertising push of it. Um, it hasn't been out there that long. Yeah, we anticipate with uh, faculty senate endorsement that uh, we'll see a little more influx coming into the fall because most of our instructors go off contract for the summer. Um, and so it'll be, it'll be crickets most of the summer. 
um, in, the, in the org. But in the fall, as we have new division meetings, new faculty, uh, that is something that administration has expressed that they would like us to really push to new faculty to try to plant that seed early with them. So we're, we're hopeful that it will go up a little bit with that as well. Yeah, and that's what we're anticipating for fall, you know, once they get back in and we do our our annual where we come in, you know, at the beginning of the semesters, like Angela was saying, that's where they already have to be there. You know, the chairs have all their fact faculty already scheduled. You can't tell me that you had to be somewhere else. Um, and we're hoping to capture them at that point. And so then get them, get in there and learn it. So, so is it just open and they can do it? It's just open right now. Anytime. Yep. Okay. Yep. That's how it's at now. It yeah. all has to be done by the end, but Really, if you wanted to go in and finish it. If you it. want to work ahead, we highly encourage that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we have had those. We do have a few who have completed it. So, Are there yes. pieces in the class that, that you as instructors have to be present for? So no, not, no. No. No, it's, no, it's completely all, dependent. it's completely. All the, videos, all the videos within the org, all of them have transcripts, all of them are captioned, yeah. all the documents are ADA yeah. compliant. I mean, we really did go into this with the, if, we want to show the, the right way to do it and that it is doable. Yeah. And we, you know, the fifth year people or so people that have been in there have appreciated that. Yeah. And it's really more of a resource portal than an actual course. Right. There, there yeah. are no activities that they have to do or anything like that. Well, we could we could create that if the administration decided they wanted some better tracking for who's doing yeah. what. Mm -hmm. But ideally, you're showing that you've done it by doing it in your actual course. Like yeah. my syllabus is yeah. accessible. And, and that's where that rubric mm -hmm. will come in down the road. Mm -hmm. Yep. Are there, are there other questions? We're happy to share our resources. Yes. If you want an in-depth look, yep. know, we're happy to actually do up the videos that shows yep. everything piece by piece and send that out to you. Yeah, and we would like, if you guys can flip over your bingo card yeah. and fill out a survey Let for us. us. Doing, we're just trying doing. to figure out, you know, like what other people are doing, where you're at, um, just so we know and get some more information out of there because it's, you know, you kind of learn from others and yeah. see what's but out we're, there. We're more than happy to share what we have. And yeah. Yes. We more than appreciate you sharing what you have. Yeah. We've been researching, you know, friends got a question. You do pay. Oh, go ahead. Um, do you guys have a large address pool too? Or do you have multiple, like, we, have a we have a decent, we have a decent, yeah, yeah, we have a decent adjunct. The adjunct pool is not full time. It's not maybe going to be there permanently. Mm. That's Are they getting classes pulled in for them or are they kind of creating their own content? A little of both. Mm -hmm. um, we have mm -hmm. most, we have a lot that are copied over. Uh, we have several adjuncts who have been with us for a while that have built their own courses. Um, all of the adjuncts are put in the box in the org as well, and so all of the orgs, all of the, or all of the adjuncts, all of the full-time faculty, all tenure, the chairs, they're all in that org. And I should say too, a lot of our adjunct faculty are up at our uh, not a lot, but we do have some at our Coeur d'Alene site, um, and we try to get up there at least once a semester so that they have an instructional designer there even if they're not making it to our Lewiston campus where Angela and I where we have our offices we try to make it up there at least once so that they have a physical person and they all all of our adjuncts are aware that Angela and I will meet with them through video conference through anything so if they need us we're there we just, we just have challenges with the adjuncts because yeah. they're not full-time they're, yep. they're doing this on the side yep and if they're getting a brand new course and they're getting it like weeks before classes start, yep right. how are they going to have all this material done right so we're hoping to address some of that with master courses, um, but yes. we're kind of waiting to tackle that until we figure out the LMS situation. Right. <laughs> yeah, really? everything's all contingent. Kind of what we're hoping to work toward, or what we've been discussing. <laughs> That's just awful. It's gonna be the quietest <laughs> ride home ever. <laughs> yeah, because um, we looked at having a media server, because it's like, if we're gonna pay someone to caption your videos for you, then we need to have control of that, because if you do leave, and we've paid you to caption that, well, we should still have copies of that. And so what we're looking at instead of requiring them to host on a media server is they would still keep their stuff at YouTube and have it captioned there, but they would provide the compliance officer with a copy of their transcript and a copy of their video file. So that if they did ever leave, it wouldn't take much for whoever took over their course to upload that video and drop in the, the transcript to create the captions. And that way we have an accounting of of everybody's transcripts. We know, we can verify that these have been captioned because we've got copies of the videos and the transcripts and just on a backup server somewhere. Yeah, because when we archive every semester now, we archive links. We don't 
don't yeah. archive videos. And yeah. so, you know, that was definitely one of the bigger loops that we had or in the, in the beginning is who owns it. So, right. you know, we say compliance officer loosely, like there's this magical person right. who's going to send from the heavens, um, which is kind of what I'm hoping because I do state authorization too, and it'd be really nice to pass that on to somebody. Um, but <laughs> but uh, if we, you know, we have this magical person, they would be in charge of that, and then they would do some other things on campus as well. So. Um, otherwise, you're looking at probably the chairs be that person or a division representative to be that person. Um, I wouldn't see anybody in ELS doing that, but never say never. Right. <laughs> and, and the provost was very supportive of the idea that, that it is not our department's, we don't have the staff for it in our department. Like, she's very supportive of getting some sort of compliance officer, so a new position. Yeah. So if anybody has money that you guys aren't using and you'd like to forward that to us, we would gladly we'll take it. We'll take it. We also take MET money. We do take MET money. <laughs> we did hire um, like students to help with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, There's and that, that is. As well. And it was so hard to get them to do that for more than like oh. two days. And they, Interesting. Because it's really It's a little mind It is very really monotonous. Really tedious. And yeah. what, we, mm -hmm. what we came up with was having the students do that with mm -hmm. eight minutes for every one minute. As well. Oh, wow. OK. Oh. That's good to know. So something technical. Yep. Like, Yes. So that was one of the things we were talking with, like, especially our nursing division is large. It's yeah. one of our, and but we were talking like if I were to caption a nursing video, and I have no nursing background, like I, it would take me forever. But if you have a student who just took the class, do the captioning for it, they're gonna, you know, they're the extra yeah. bonus points in the class. Yeah. The like, <laughs> you know. Yes. I cry a little bit. Yeah. Um, I no, <laughs> no it's, it's really buy-in. I think they all see the importance of it, right. at least in our yes. area. They see the importance of it, and there are those lawsuits. And we actually yeah, did yeah. bring quite a few of those up early yeah, on. Just point yeah. Montana. I mean, we pick on Aaron all the time. That you know. Montana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so. <laughs> yep. Yep. And we use that. We're, we're part of Thunder Right. Of Yes, mm -hmm. and it, and yeah. Yes. That's what we're trying to avoid. We would like to be more proactive. Well, we have more to proactive be. Proactive, as opposed to reactive. <laughs> and we have to be. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I will say that it seems like when, I hate to say it, but when the lawsuits are a little closer to home, so say Montana and not MIT, it's it hasn't affected you guys? Interesting. You are under them, yes. Yep. Um, we have talked a little bit about um, wanting to bring possibly someone onto campus who could present, you know, have a keynote speaker one evening and have the faculty, because a lot of it is, yeah, they know captioning is important, and they, and, yeah, yeah, and Aaron do it. Yes, and it didn't, yeah, and it, it still didn't sink in. Yes. And yep. And that's where, right, and that's where we get into that. We are trying to push it as a universal design policy right. across campus. That, you know, those captionings, yes, they help, you know, the deaf student, but they also help the mom with a loud kid screaming in the background. They help an English, you know, English as a second language student, you know, all those things. And yes, and we have an institute for intensive English, and like, you're helping those students. Yeah, like, we have a lot of students. Watch, you know, they're on the bus a lot. The on the bus so, and that's what, and that's where we are too. Just it. I mean, we've talked about it for the better part of a year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And we've been really talking about it the better part of a year. Yeah. And I mean, they're just we keep right. beating the drum, and I mean, they they can only ignore me so long. Yeah. I'm kind of loud. So. And, and so really <laughs> promote like we're here for you. Yeah. We don't expect you to do this on your own. Like, yeah, right. You can come into our office at any time. I get instructors emailing me. Could you look at my syllabus really quick and make sure that I got everything? Yeah. yeah. No problem. Absolutely. Yeah. Right, and that's how that's how our Coeur d'Alene staff kind of feel, and so, yeah. And that's what, when we started this back. Don and I came to LCSE around the same time, and I think that's where it had been. They had been without any learning services director for a little while due to an illness, and so, um, at no fault of their own, people just didn't know, and so. It's an awareness. And so it's part of us, yeah, part of us is there to be like, no, we really have to do this. And I will admit, you know, like you're saying, like the, well, I don't care that you, you know, like, 
it, was, yeah, it was like you, system changing exactly. our LMS was the faculty reps said that they couldn't have 20 different colors. Yes, right. yes. Oh, yep, yeah, we had that same. I said this is very facility, and yep. I'm going to say I don't have any Exactly. That's not for me to say. Right. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. And, and, and I did, I, I got so tired of presenting yeah. this. Well, I don't care if you think you don't Right. Yeah. And my yeah. thing is, too, it's like you're not doing it just for the person who, you know, like if your vision's just bad, you're not at the point where it is considered a disability, but you just don't have the best of vision, like it helps everyone. Oh, I don't know how many students actually say, well, I'm colorblind. Yeah. I'm going to tell student services yeah. about that. Right. They, they probably don't. Right. It makes but a difference. those issues come up and yep. they affect their ability to get the content they need. So. Well, we will let you guys yeah, we're go. We're, we're over time. Yeah, so, for the service, we have the any service. questions, we're available um, after the fact as well. Thank you. Thank you.